Mm. Hello, uh, good afternoon to everyone, uh, dear participants, dear guests. I'm pleased to welcome you to the first webinar in the series uh, titled Health Financing in India. Today's event is hosted by P4H, which is a global network for social health protection and the original abbreviation started with providing for health term uh, and it works for health financing um, uh, to efforts to uh, in improve collaboration globally. Uh, this event is organized also in collaboration with our dear uh, partners from India, Access Health International and India Health Systems Collaborative or IHSC who bring together premier institutes working on health financing in India and beyond. Uh, my name is Ainur Ayyapkanova. I am your uh, master of the ceremony today. I'll be uh, happy and I'm thrilled to serve you. Uh, I am from Kazakhstan originally, and I also uh, collaborate with P4H, today's um, organization that's hosting the event. Uh, and I'd like to uh, give a little introduction to our event. In context of COVID-19 pandemic, we're all facing social health protection and health financing became the spotlight of global health funders, governments, NGOs, and many other players in the landscape of global, regional, national, subnational stakeholders. And not only because the, this domain is key to sustain and improve population health or public health, but also because of the gained understanding of the need for pandemic preparedness and management, as well as the impact of health sector on economic performance. And I would like to uh, especially mention that India is a powerful country on the global arena, and it has much potential to influence not only domestic policy, but also its neighbors, other countries and global actors by learning from experiences and best practices in health financing uh, and considering that we are hosting it in light of the uh, pandemic. Um, and today's webinar is organized by global health financing stakeholders exclusively for India. And I'm thrilled again to say that we have more than 100 participants who registered for today's event, who expressed their interest. Uh, and uh, the event is being recorded. So although maybe not everyone who registered is already here with us in real time, we will all have access to the recording of the event. Uh, and because this is the first webinar on this, uh, from the series of webinars to come, you also have the chance to contact the organizers and influence what topics should be uh, focusing, should we be focusing in the future events. Uh, the proposed webinar series aims to bring together national and international health systems and financing experts, economists, researchers, to discuss um, the priority issues in health financing and social health protection in attempts to search for ways forward. So this was a little introduction onto the scope and the purpose of event. And now I'd like to give some technical instructions for today's um, technology we're using, which is Zoom. Um, the chat box of Zoom, the typical chat, uh, is devoted only for IT technology issues like connections, etc. Uh, if you have a technical question, like a professional question about the health financing or the topic we're discussing, then uh, we are asking you to use the question function, Q&A function. Uh, and please, when you write your question, also mention the particular speaker to whom you are addressing it so that we can correctly address your question to the panelist. And as I said, this session is being recorded uh, and we should all get the links for the recording later. And right now, uh, it is my pleasure to give the welcome speech, uh, the first word to Dr. Krishna Reddy. Uh, Dr. Krishna Reddy is a cardiologist. Uh, he has co-founded Care Hospitals in 1997, which is a tertiary care hospitals chain uh, located across six states in India. He also founded uh, Relysis Medical Devices, which manufactures low-cost, affordable cardiac devices. He's a strong champion in primary health care and integrated care in rural India, very important areas for health system strengthening. And currently, he is the country's director of Access Health International. With this accolade of accomplishments, uh, I'm very thrilled to and honored to give the floor to Dr. Krishna Reddy for welcome words, please. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction. And, uh, uh, on behalf of Access Health International, uh, it's my warm welcome to all the panelists, uh, the participants, and also the colleagues from P4H. 
this is, I think, the right time, uh, uh, the way the COVID has disrupted the health systems across the world, to revisit some of our concepts on health system design, our concepts on health financing, our concepts on healthcare provision, uh, what we are used to uh, the normal state assessment, <clears throat> because our health financing is designed for a normal state. It is not designed for crisis state. Uh, as a cardiologist, uh, when we describe the normal heart function, uh, we say the normal heart function should pump enough blood to meet the needs of all the tissues, both at rest as well as during stress. So the stress component of function of health system is actually ignored in most of the health system design and health system financing. Uh, that's what I thought, I think uh, this series of webinars is the most aptly designed uh, for this situation to revisit the very concept of health financing for universal health coverage. Uh, again, I think as a clinician, my own uh, issues related to the financing needs of health system versus the financial protection of the people. Uh, Why there is a financial protection of the people as part of the universal health coverage, the financing needs to provide the needed supply of healthcare provision. Uh, that is not adequately addressed as to how do you finance to create the infrastructure so that people get to access healthcare in the first hour of their emergency, when they need it, where they need it, and how they need it. Uh, that is forgotten. And similarly, when we have the priority settings in health financing or the coverage, we ignore that at an individual level, every health need is a need. So then how do you provide those innovative solutions for conditions which are not covered, which are not protected, the rare genetic diseases, or some of the tropical diseases, or uh, diseases that are not covered, or even the areas of primary healthcare that are not covered. So there is a need for innovative thinking in terms of how do you finance the unmet, unprotected, or uncovered, uh, because the priority setting, I mean, any public health insurance or any public health system can only do X amount of coverage. It cannot do the universal 100% coverage. Uh, and, in a similar way, I mean, uh, if a person meets their healthcare finances through either savings or through borrowings or through the insurance protection. So is there a mechanism to actually make even the borrowings when they are needed? That means to meet the unprotected needs uh, with the advance in the fintech solutions and the ease of uh, credit ratings and giving the consumer financing uh, why the financing system is not looking at the health consumer financing in a most uh, useful way. I mean, these are some of the questions from my side as a part of the introductory uh, opening for this interesting webinar. Uh, as a student of health systems, I, I will be more keen to listen to the, uh, the panelist experts in the health financing. Uh, with these few words, uh, I think my uh, welcome to all the participants again. And uh, I hope uh, it will be a very interesting and impactful session in the next four months, I think as a part of the four series webinar. Uh, thanks, thanks for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Reddy. Uh, your genuine words uh, are really important. I think they set the tone for today's event to uh, be asking the needed question and to be searching uh, the solutions in the right direction. Thank you so much for your welcome words. Uh, now the next uh, welcome word uh, would be given to Mr. Claude Mayer, who is since 2011, the coordinator of the P4H network, uh, the host organization for today's, uh, today's webinar. Uh, he will have uh, more slides and better words to describe what P4H network is and where it's heading, but I'll just give some background uh, information about his professional path, uh, which is um, Claude holds a 
a master's in international affairs degree and economics degree from uh, uh, Institut d'Etudre Politique de Paris. Sorry for my French, basically. So, uh, yeah, it's a renowned institute in Paris. Uh, and after numerous assignments, uh, which he has held afterwards in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Yemen, in Philippines, uh, in collaboration with global players and actors such as the European Union, the German agency GIZ, and other um, NGOs, um, uh, the, these assignments and consultancy projects and leadership projects have been all uh, around and for improvement of health systems management and financing systems. And so the social health protection, health financing issues have been, I think, the, uh, the main core professional path of uh, Mr. Claude Mayer, and I'm happy to give the floor to you, Claude. Thank you, I know, and uh... Welcome to uh, all the participants. Um, it is also an honor for me to uh, introduce the, the P4H network in, in, uh, in this uh, first webinar of the series. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Where is it? Uh, why is it not working? I apologize for a little technical glitch. I think you can be able to launch your slides, Claude. Uh, I ask coordination. Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry it's for working. That. It is working. Yeah. Sorry for that. No problem. Yeah, so, so um, I hope it is full screen. Yeah, OK. Um, so um, I will try to be short. Um, I have uh, only a few minutes. Uh, the P4H network. Um, came actually uh, as a, um, an initiative um, launched in a, a G8 summit in 2007 in Germany, in Heiligendamm. So it's already 14 years old. We are a teenager as a network, so a bit uh, nasty, uh, but we will calm down soon. Uh, the, 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 the interesting part of, uh, of this early launch of the P4H network in 2007 is that we were already organizing um, a kind of coalition of partners to work on the topic of health financing when uh, the WHO report on health systems financing came out only in 2010. So we were a kind of front runner. Uh, we have uh, detailed uh, terms of reference for the network that have been elaborated over, over the time, over time. Uh, the main goal is really to support the development of sustainable and equitable uh, health financing systems towards UHC. So um, the main question is, okay, why, why is this network different and how do we consider the topic? And, and this is really where I would like to insist is that we have a unique uh, approach of health financing in the sense of the multi-sectoral um, lenses that we try to put on, on this topic. Um, we consider social health protection and health financing really at the intersection uh, across uh, those three sectors, mainly that are health, um, uh, social protection and finance. And this little drawing that uh, we prepared on the right side uh, is really like uh, trying to represent how each kind of institution and each sector is thinking about uh, health financing from its own perspective, like the health system person, like the WHO represented in this cartoon, is thinking about health financing as one pillar of the health systems. Uh, the World Bank can think about it uh, both uh, as um, uh, a main topic of, of, a public of public funding, as well as a main strategy of poverty er eradication. Uh, ILO can consider it as part of a broader social protection agenda and, 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 and even other perspectives. So it's, it's really, the, 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 I would say, the unique and the, the specific way of looking at health financing of the P4H network from scratch, from beginning in 2007. At the moment, it was started only with five institutions, um, and uh, now we, we, we are 18 and soon uh, probably 19, because we also got a, um, a request from Thailand uh, to join the network. So um, we have at the same time multilateral institutions that correspond to those three sectors, uh, health, social protection and finance. We have the development banks, we have uh, 
global health initiatives like the Global Fund and GFF. Uh, we, we have some bilateral, some countries. Uh, we have some country institutions and we have also academic uh, institutions. So it's, it's quite diversified. And uh, the, the, the really the idea is that as uh, uh, Dr. Krishna uh, already was already mentioning is we try to, to find innovative ways to think about health financing. And our theory of change is that we believe that a diversity of institutions and of perspectives will uh, create, will generate some, uh, some uh, innovations. That's our result framework. I would like to insist just on two things. At impact level, of course, our goal is related to 3.8.2, uh, sorry, um, about financial protection. Uh, so to, to reduce, uh, of course, uh, um, the out-of-pocket expenditures and, uh, and the impoverishment, impoverishment uh, related to, uh, to um, direct payments. And the, 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 the most important part for us in this result framework is uh, at output level, uh, where the P4H uh, network is uh, supposed to contribute to five different outputs, uh, a high level and multi-sectoral commitment of the countries to uh, public funding of, of health, uh, to set up collaborative networks at uh, a national, uh, regional and global level, to have coherent, coherent frameworks uh, around health financing, so no, no competition or no contradiction between the different levels, for example. And the, uh, the fourth one is the link uh, between the health financing dimension and uh, broader health systems, data, um, uh, human resource, and, 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 and of course, emergency as, as we are in this uh, time of pandemic. And uh, the fifth one that is related to the, the comment of uh, um, uh, Dr. Krishna Reddy, uh, that is about the innovation, and, and uh, I will give one example of innovation that was uh, triggered by a collaboration in the network. The main services and products that we offer is what we call a P4H country focal person that is main in charge of connecting, circulating information and facilitating joint work in health financing. That's uh, the example of Nina that many of uh, or some of you might know from India. Um, this is a list of, uh, of uh, different uh, uh, country focal persons that we have in the world at the moment. We are now close to 20 and, and it's still increasing with uh, new openings coming up. Uh, we, are also, we also have a coordination desk that is located at the same time in WHO HQ and in ILO HQ. Uh, we are supposed to have somebody in the World Bank as well, but the position is vacant. And we have a support team as well uh, uh, for the P4H uh, network in the GIZ uh, with uh, Torsten and Nina, who shifted from, uh, from um, India to, to Germany, but who is still with us in P4H. Um, the, the world, uh, the, the map of, of the world, uh, we, we, have, we try to, in this map, we try to show both the members and uh, places, uh, especially the ones in red, where we have uh, country focal persons and uh, in dark blue uh, countries where we have been working in the past, but not at the moment. And, and in the light blue, the countries where we have some collaboration going on, but without country focal person at the moment. Another uh, product, and uh, I'm almost about to close, uh, another product of the, pro of the network is the Leadership for UHC program uh, that is really uh, um, uh, program over one year that tries to address the non-technical, the adaptive issues uh, in the health financing processes and in the health financing reforms, and try, trying to address those bottlenecks that are uh, adaptive and non-technical. We have already uh, several years of experience in, in uh, implementing this program, and there, there is an idea of uh, having uh, this uh, with a, a diversity of partners implemented even for either India as a whole or certain states in India. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is the fact that we have a whole digital ecosystem in P4H that is also uh, a kind of uh, knowledge management contribution uh, of the P4H network to the exchanges on, on the international exchanges on health financing. We have our own uh, uh, collaborative website plus Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, etc. Uh, all this can be can be found on on, uh, on the internet, and uh, you are warmly uh, um, advised to uh, to uh, register in the in the platform where you can access um, uh, many many information on health financing, 
uh, documents, uh, events, etc. Um, other like uh, yeah, I was already mentioned Twitter account, etc. I would like to give uh, the floor back to you, Ainoa. Thank you very much, and sorry if I went a little bit over the time. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you, Claude. Uh, it was a very good um, second, my video. Um, thank you, Claude. It was a very good uh, comprehensive introduction of P4H network, uh, of its directions, uh, services, and products. I hope it's, um, it's very symbolic that at the first webinar launched in the series in India, we're introducing this um, network's um, potential for growth. Uh, and now I'd like to switch everyone's attention to our next uh, section. Our webinar includes country experiences, presentations from three countries. And the purpose of this section of the webinar is to learn from different countries from various geographic regions, um, recent, most recent health financing reports Forms, especially taking um, uh, given in light of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic to see how uh, common struggles we all face have been managed and dealt uh, at different regions. And here in this section, I'd like to give the words uh, of welcome and the floor will be given to Jessica Yen. Uh, Jessica uh, is an economist by training with eight years of health financing and health system strengthening experience. And she's representing the country of Ethiopia uh, where she's the P4H uh, country focal person. Uh, and most recently, before this um, uh, duty, she has worked as the focal person for health sector reforms at the Minister of Finance in Sweden. Uh, previously, Jessica has worked at the Clinton Health Access uh, Initiative. Uh, she has uh, been uh, based in Tanzania, previously supporting the implementation of the national community-based health program. Uh, she later joined uh, CHAI's global health financing team, supporting countries across East and Southern Africa in strengthening their health financing systems. So uh, an expert in the field, uh, Jessica, we're um, happy to welcome you and give you the floor, please. Thank you, Einar. Um, hi, I'm Jessica, and as I mentioned, I now work for WHO. I'm the new P4H country focal person for Ethiopia, and I'm very excited to be here today to speak about the Ethiopian experience on health financing and social protection. So I'm not sure if I can <laughs> flip through the slides, but maybe Einar will be able to help me. Uh, yes, the team will uh, uh, flip it. So we have an excellent coordination team. Okay, you can go back to the last page. Um, thank you. So just to start, um, the Ethiopian government has set quite an ambitious goal in reaching in that they want to reach UHC by 2035. And their plan to in order to reach this is to roll out insurance schemes. So both for the formal sector as well as the informal sector. And the hope is to be able to raise additional resources for health, but also provide financial protection through these schemes. And in my presentation now, I will focus on the rollout of these insurance schemes. So I'll start with a description of the design of the schemes and also talk about the challenges as well as the progress made. In the last part, I'll quickly talk about the P4H collaboration in Ethiopia. So we can move on. If you flip to the first content page. Yes, thank you. So starting with the CBHI, the community-based health insurance scheme for the informal sector, it was piloted in 2011 and is currently being scaled up across the country. And the enrollment happens on the household level and it's voluntary. It's financed by membership fees, but the federal government also provides a general subsidy of 25%. And in addition, districts and regions are responsible to, for subsi subsidizing indigents, so poor households that can't afford the membership fees. Um, on the other hand, the SHI, the Social Health Insurance Scheme for the formal sector, the idea there is to have it mandatory and for employees to contribute a fixed percentage of their salary with matching contributions for, from employers. Um, the SHI has yet to be rolled out, so but at the same time, it's also been delayed a couple of times. It's still unclear exactly when it will be able to launch. Um, on the other hand, the CBHI, so the one for the informal sector, and it's now already 
been introduced in about 80% of all districts, so all across the country, and is covering about half of the eligible population, roughly 32 million people in Ethiopia. Um, so it's already um, reaching quite a lot of people, and it's doing that despite being voluntary by primarily leveraging a lot of the existing institutions in Ethiopia. So, for example, um, the community volunteers, the health development army in Ethiopia has been key in um, both sending information, but also generating demand for CBHI in their communities. Um, so those, that's the current status of CBHI and the progress made so far. But at the same time, it's also facing a lot of challenges. So for example, the CBHI is managed by the districts. Um, the schemes are often relatively small and many of them also face financial sustainability issues. There's also limited risk sharing across schemes, so across district. Um, so the risk pooling is uh, suboptimal at the moment. And in addition, because it's voluntary, there's the risk of adverse selection with high-risk household um, being more um, willing to join the scheme. Now the government does realize these challenges and for the future, it, it, will, it has the intent to make CBHI mandatory. Uh, in addition, there are also a number of technical as well as supply side challenges. So we see both drug stockouts as well as low quality of care, which means that there's the risk of lower renewal rates and members be un being unsatisfied, unsatisfied with, um, with the scheme. In addition, the CBHI claims management as well as enrollment management is still paper-based. So that, as you can imagine, is, is quite inefficient and often leads to delays, which affects both the healthcare providers uh, as well as the members of the regime. So that's a couple of quick comments on the current challenges of the CBHI. In the long term, once the CBHI is launched, um, they will be in, in the beginning at least two separate schemes, but the government plans to merge them eventually because they don't want to have two, two separate schemes and a two-tiered health, healthcare system. Um, but then again, how to merge the schemes and when to do it in the best way, that will be a, a big challenge also for the long term. So that's a couple of, yeah, that's a short description of the the two insurance schemes in Ethiopia, the challenges they're facing, as well as the progress that's been made. I'll also quickly talk about the P4H collaboration. Thanks. Um, so uh, the collaboration in Ethiopia is relatively new. We've been here since June this year when I joined WHO and P4H. As such, we're more in the sort of um, phase where we're exploring how best to support the ministry as well as the health insurance agency, and also how best to work together with other partners um, in line with the sort of collaborative approach that Claude talked about. Um, and, but I can still mention a couple of activities that are in the pipeline. So first of all, we are working with Chai, Bergen University and other partners to support the insurance agency in raising the benefit package for insurance. And the idea here is to create a revised uh, package that contains an explicit list of services and for the package to be um, both affordable as well as informed by evidence. And then this package will be adapted to the regions and rolled out across the country. We're also working with the World Bank to develop and deliver the training for the ministry as well as for the insurance agency. And because the system in Ethiopia is quite decentralized, this training will be delivered both nationally as well as subnationally. And the idea here is to build capacity so that the key players, uh, the Ministry of Health, the EHI, the Health Insurance Agency, will be able to address some of these technical and strategic challenges that I, I mentioned earlier. And then finally, um, I'm also part of WHO Health System Strengthening Cluster. So together with the other team members in my team. Um, I work to strengthen the health system across the health system building blocks. And through that, we'll hopefully be able to address some of the supply side challenges as well that I mentioned earlier. So the low quality of healthcare, the um, drug stockouts, et cetera. Um, yes, so that's a quick introduction to 
the ongoing reforms in Ethiopia. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. And if you have want to discuss further, feel free to, to react to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear Jessica. I think your presentation is giving us some good learning lessons of collaboration across different stakeholders, including the global, local governments, uh, most importantly, the uh, Social Health Insurance Agency of Ethiopia. And I think uh, in addition to this collaboration example, the having the uh, different types of insurance schemes like social uh, community-based health insurance schemes and others, I think this is all maybe new, maybe interesting for others for us to explore. Uh, if there are questions, they could be typed uh, by participants. And now I will switch to uh, giving the floor to our next speakers. Uh, the next country experience will be from Kazakhstan. Uh, Dr. Almat Jovashev is a uh, physician by training. He has an MD degree from Kazakhstan and a master's in public health degree from Emory University in the United States. He has worked for more than 10 years as head of director, as director of department for strategy at various national organizations, including uh, the Social Health Insurance Fund's uh, deputy director for development and strategy. Uh, currently, he's advisor to the CEO of the Republican Center for Healthcare Development, which is a health policy think tank of the Ministry of Health and which is the partner of uh, P4H um, governing board uh, from Kazakhstan. So Almat, please, the floor is yours to highlight some recently implemented reforms in Kazakhstan. Uh, thank you very much, Enor, for a gentle introduction. Um, my structure of my presentation is going to be similar to Jessica's. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the uh, major healthcare reform in Kazakhstan, and then I'm going to uh, shortly uh, touch upon our collaboration with, within the P4H network. So the major healthcare financial reform in Kazakhstan that uh, happened recently uh, was uh, introduction of social health insurance in 2020 in order to assert the universal health uh, coverage of our citizens. And the main reason why we have implemented this system was that our current uh, single payer system wasn't coping enough with the uh, rising cost of healthcare in Kazakhstan. For instance, according to the national health accounts, the uh, government spending towards healthcare has doubled. Uh, during the last 10 years. At the same time, the private uh, expenditure, out-of-pocket expenditure has risen from 31% to 40% out of all expenditures in Kazakhstan, which uh, showed that uh, we've been failing uh, uh, on the topic of addressing the, uh, the universal health uh, access to our citizens. And that's why the solution was that uh, we need to switch from single pair to multi pair system. On the left hand side of my presentation, you can see funding sources. And uh, what we did was that uh, our government involved the private and public uh, corporations, employers uh, to cover the employees in, inside of the social health insurance plan. And it's uh, like in Ethiopia, it's a, a voluntary basis. So we pretty much have the same uh, challenges that I'm going to touch briefly also. So the government uh, provides location for free medical care for all program uh, within this uh, entire scheme of social health insurance. So you can see on the right, uh, right hand side of my presentation, the benefits, the guarantees, free medical care and the social health insurance these two distinct programs within the social health insurance uh, plan. Uh, first of all, the number one, the free medical care for all provided by the government and everyone in our country, despite your uh, status, uh, if you are covered or not, uh, you are eligible to receive primary health care, uh, get vaccination, receive emergency care, treatment of socially significant diseases and infectious diseases. Uh, some of them like oncology, the tuberculosis, HIV, and others. The state, uh, the state also subsidized the, uh, certain uh, groups of people, uh, namely 15 groups of people, including those who are uh, on maternal leave, uh, who's receiving the um, unemployment benefits, elderly, the 
uh, young and adolescents, students and like. So those who are covered by the uh, social insurance plan, they uh, receive the more broad the benefits from the uh, healthcare for free. Uh, for instance, they can uh, receive the specialized outpatient services, uh, including the laboratory and uh, instrumental diagnostics, uh, elective surgery and quaternary care, rehabilitative care, etc. So this is a uh, broad structure of the uh, social health insurance system that existing right now in Kazakhstan. Um, even though it's too early to assess the impact of social health insurance system, uh, the ongoing outbreak of coronavirus uh, has um, exposed some challenges that we have. One of the challenges uh, that we observed was that uh, we noticed that a lot of people have um, uh, emergency care. So there, there, there was a influx of patient flow to the emergency care and uh, the, uh, that impacted the elective care, the tertiary care settings. So if you see this benefit, there's uh, this guaranteed free care and the social uh, health insurance. Uh, both of them are divided by the invisible uh, firewall. So the money cannot be allocated uh, between these two packages. And one is heavily uh, focused on emergency care, another one is the plant care. And uh, this ongoing outbreak of coronavirus caused a deficit, budget deficit in one side and the surplus in the other side. And uh, the challenge was to allocate the uh, resources that we had between these programs. And it actually still happens. And, uh, Hopefully, future reforms will going to address that, and we're going to amend our uh, laws so that there is a more flexible way for, of, uh, uh, in case we have such outbreaks in the future. Another challenge is that since it's a uh, voluntary basis, Timar, uh, uh, we still uh, have challenge of involving uh, private entities, especially those who are self-employed. Uh, into the uh, social health insurance plan. So that's one of the challenges that we also have uh, similar to Ethiopia. So let's uh, switch to our experience with P4H. Uh, our experience with P4H uh, started from 2017 when we uh, became a member of steering committee. We organized international conference on healthcare financing in 2018, and P4H helped us to train our representatives in, from Ministry of Health and the Social Health Insurance Fund in the topic of technical aspects of implementation of social health insurance in 2019. At the same year, uh, we hosted their second round of Asian Leadership for Universal Healthcare Coverage Program uh, with uh, representatives from Pakistan, Myanmar, and Thailand. And all that experience uh, happened, uh, we call it BC, before coronavirus. And uh, unfortunately, the, this ongoing outbreak has impacted a lot uh, of this, uh, the, the, the collaboration between us and the P4H. And we are looking forward to our future uh, mutual uh, beneficial collaboration with the members of P4H and knowledge sharing between us. Thank you so much. Thank you all much for your uh, uh, country experience uh, presentation for sharing the recent reforms. Uh, and so after now talking uh, about African experience, Central Asian experience, we now switch to uh, hearing about South uh, Asian, uh, Southeast Asian experience or East Asian experience uh, from the country of Vietnam. We'll be hearing from uh, Ms. Marielle Gorsat, 
who uh, is uh, a technical uh, chief technical advisor to international labor organization. And she's uh, working for three countries, which is Vietnam, Laos, and Myanmar from ILO. Uh, for over 15 years, Marielle has worked in improving uh, social health protection systems, health financing systems, uh, co collaborating with governments, uh, with NGOs, global partners, local governments. And uh, she holds a master's degree in international uh, cooperation and development and politics from La Sorbonne University in Paris, as well as postgraduate French degrees in public health and epidemiology. Uh, Marielle, the floor is yours. Please. Thank you very much, Aino, for the, for the introduction. Um, my presentation will uh, follow the same structure as my French colleagues, uh, starting by a, a few words about Vietnam health financing. Uh, and social health protection system, and then going on uh, on the role uh, of the P4H in, in supporting this area of work. Um, so in a few words, uh, in Vietnam, the health sector has been a, a major priority, a core priority of, of the party, the Communist Party, uh, for decades. Um, as we can see from the government allocation that are reaching about 9% uh, of the budget every year, uh, with current health expenditure representing about 6% of, of GDP. Uh, social health protection is provided to the population through uh, health insurance, uh, social health insurance, which cover today uh, over 90% of the population, that represents about 85 million people. Um, and the health insurance system is placed under uh, the oversight of the Ministry of Health uh, and implemented by uh, a social security institution, uh, Vietnam Social Security, which is managing other uh, social security contingency along with health, also pension, maternity benefits, and, and so on. Uh, some of the key features of these health insurance systems include a mandatory coverage for the entire population, uh, a single pool uh, with a unique benefit package for the entire population to maximize a redistribution and the distribution of, of risk and, and resources. Um, despite this broad population coverage, we, which is quite an achievement if you consider also the share of the informal uh, population in the total labor force, uh, there are of course uh, challenges, including the fact that financial protection uh, is improving but is still limited with high out-of-pocket expenditure. Uh, the health-related uh, impoverishment remains quite high, about 10% of households facing catastrophic health expenditures. So the health insurance is still to uh, address a number of challenges, uh, including covering the miss missing middle. Uh, about 10 million people uh, remain in, uh, uncovered, uh, particularly workers in the informal economy, uh, migrants, uh, undocumented people. Uh, there is also a, a growing deficit uh, every year that is accumulating and um, an increased demand for better quality uh, of health care from a growing middle class. And as in many uh, health insurance systems, a few uh, dysfunctionalities in the design and the implementation. Uh, so in this context, uh, the, the major health financing and social health protection reforms uh, includes, uh, first of all, uh, some um, measures uh, to maximize cost control uh, with better provision on provider payments mechanisms, including a shift from the current fee-for-service systems uh, to more reliance on DRG and capitation, uh, strengthening the management of the SHI fund. Um, to further expand the population coverage, the, the government is also looking at additional contribution subsidies and, and restructuring the way the membership is, uh, is, uh, is designed, defined uh, today. Um, the government is also looking at expanding the SHI benefit package, which, which is already comprehensive, uh, but not necessarily answering the need of a higher income household. Uh, finally, uh, also as a way of both increasing quality of care, uh, availability of services, uh, and uh, cost control, uh, the government is looking into strengthening the role of, uh, of grassroots healthcare systems and family doctors uh, to further strengthen primary health care uh, and referral mechanisms. Uh, so how is uh, P4H helping uh, in uh, designing and uh, implementing those reforms in the country? 
uh, well, with some simplification, I would say that P4H partners are organizing uh, their support to the government through, let's say, three building blocks. Uh, first, partners are helping the government and key uh, stakeholders uh, to formulate uh, policy options with the production of evidence through research, literature reviews, assessments, uh, etc., as a joint uh, efforts. Uh, secondly, partners are also supporting policy dialogues by promoting and encouraging debates across all, stakeholder, all stakeholders at all levels of the government and beyond, uh, including uh, trade unions, uh, employer representatives, mass organizations, uh, so that reforms are more inclusive uh, and responsive uh, to the society's needs. Uh, and of course, uh, P4H uh, partners are also trying to support mainstreaming of capacity building in all the topics covered. And uh, to make this support as effective as possible, P4H is supporting the coordination uh, of efforts across development partners. Uh, for instance, whenever possible, we try to uh, align our uh, recommendation, the recommendation we are making to the governments, uh, for instance, on the topic of the additional benefit package to be provided, uh, we are trying to, to talk as a common, with a common voice in all workshops and, uh, and, and seminars, uh, all to produce a joint technical notes. On capacity building, the P4H network supported the participation of Vietnam to the leadership for UHC program uh, that was mentioned uh, earlier on. Uh, and um, it's a simple measure, but uh, to foster uh, coordination, uh, we also developed a joint training uh, matrix uh, that helps keeping track on um, the training that were organized uh, so that we know who has benefited from what uh, and better identify uh, capacity building gaps and avoid redundancy. Uh, we follow uh, the same approach uh, for different pieces of work. For instance, one of the major uh, ongoing reform is the, 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 the development of a new health insurance law. And the DPs have come uh, with a, a joint plan that identifies a core policy option that the government is looking into. Uh, and we identify which partners want to support, which area each partner wants to support based on its own expertise, interest, uh, so that we can better identify synergies and complementarities for a better support to the government. Uh, as P4H focal point, I'm also uh, actively promoting uh, exchange of information on, on, um, on policy reforms, on planned events, uh, ongoing research uh, through coordinated uh, DPs meetings, or using uh, the platform, the P4H platform that was uh, mentioned earlier on. Uh, we are updating this page on a weekly basis, so please feel free to, uh, to access the Vietnam page if you want more information about what's going on uh, in, in the country. Uh, and finally, because uh, I, I want to reflect uh, the, the point that uh, Claude was making when presenting the P4H network with uh, each uh, agency or uh, P4H partner having a specific mandate, which is contributing to the richness of the network. Uh, as I'm working for the, the ILO and due to the particular mandate of the ILO as focal point, I'm also trying to make these linkages between social health protection, health financing, but also the broader uh, social protection agenda, particularly for instance on sickness benefits, we, uh, which are very much on the agenda given the, the current pandemic, uh, but also maternity protection or employment injury. Um, so uh, I think my five minutes are over. So uh, again, uh, for more information, I invite you to look at, uh, at the, the Vietnam Report page. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Marielle, for a comprehensive review of Vietnam's country experiences, uh, reforms, and all, another great example of global partners and local partners collaboration. Uh, I think today we're seeing the kind of transformation of the way uh, uh, resources, knowledge can be pulled through e equal partnerships rather than top-down or hierarchical uh, types of collaborations that were dominant in the past. And now uh, I am uh, excited to announce the next section of our webinar, which is a special panel discussion for health financing in India. And this whole entire uh, panel discussion will be fully managed and moderated by our dear guest, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Mr. Molik Chokshi. He's director of uh, health systems.
at Access Health International, and also he is the strategic uh, strategic lead and operations lead at IHSC, today's uh, organizing partners. Um, Mr. Chokshi has great experience in capacity building and in policy development related to healthcare financing, uh, medicine procurement, pricing, immunization, and even maternal and child health in India. We are impressed by your bio as well, Dr. Um, Mr. Chokshi, I apologize, and I am thrilled to give you the floor. And uh, now watch the panel to roll out, please. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. And it's indeed a privilege to be here and moderating the panel. Uh, first, I would like to introduce the panel so that it doesn't kind of uh, uh, disturb the uh, flow of discussion. Uh, so on the panel today, I have as Professor Indrani Gupta. Indrani Gupta is, is, is uh, head for the Policy Research Unit at Institute of Economic Growth, uh, which she had established herself. And she has been working with many national and international government, including World Bank, Government of India, and she was part of the 15th uh, uh, Finance Commission. And her areas uh, of focus remove the health economics and policy, demand for health and health care, health insurance and financing, and uh, costing and cost effectiveness and uh, economics of, of disease. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Indrani, uh, uh, to agree to be on the panel. Uh, another guest that we have is, again, Nishan Jain, like Professor Indrani, he requires no introduction. Nishan is the program director for uh, GIZ, uh, and he currently heads bilateral cooperation program for strengthening health systems, health financing, and insurance uh, through support to government of India and various state governments. And he has been one of the uh, core uh, member of uh, uh, public private partnership on, on health financing in, in our country, starting from RSPY and continuing to BMJ. Thanks, Nishan, for agreeing to be on the panel. Uh, he, and he's also a, a key focal point for joint learning network on universal health coverage. Uh, our third panelist is, is Gautam Chakraborty. Uh, uh, Gautam is a dear friend and a development assistant specialist uh, health finance at USAID. Uh, and he, he kind of leads the innovation, uh, uh, health innovation portfolio at USID. Uh, he manages uh, the first development impact bond on maternal child and health, which is an innovative healthcare financing uh, in, our, in, in our country, and is also involved with the Blenheim uh, financing facility, which is response to India's uh, COVID needs. So thanks, Gautam, uh, to agree on the panel and uh, waiting to hear from you. Then we have got uh, Vaibhav Raj, who is the National Program Officer from International Labour Organization. He's, he's uh, a kind of project coordinator for the project that supports uh, employer social health insurance scheme in our country. And he has been working for past 10 years in this area and he has experience in social protection and community migration global supply chain. And, and Weber is, is again delighted uh, to be able to hear you again. Then we have got uh, Lalit Baveja, again, a good friend and someone who can look, uh, you can look on to the private insurance space. Lalit is a principal and a senior healthcare management consultant at Miniman. Uh, and he has led several projects on healthcare costing, developing reimbursement mechanisms for private and martial insurance schemes, including cases and diagnostic related group. His expertise involves in effective planning, monitoring, evaluation of health insurance schemes, data, and standards. Thanks, Lalit, to be here on the panel today. And Last we have is Angusumarai Folpa from Thailand. Uh, the reason we have got, as even though it's an India panel, we have got uh, uh, Angusumarai is that Thailand is always appreciated for uh, low investment, but kind of achieving enough kind of universal health coverage target much better than other countries. And so we thought at the end we'll uh, try to hear from Thailand and what what advantages or what different the Thailand did in kind of achieving those kind of milestones. So it, it's indeed my pleasure to uh, kind of welcome the panel. And I'll start with Professor Indrani by posing uh, two questions to you. And uh, each and every panel has got six minutes. I'll try to pose questions and then we can open on uh, to kind of question and answer. In the context of healthcare financing, you have been part of the 15th uh, 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 Finance Commission as well. What are the major healthcare reforms we're looking towards universal health coverage? That's number one. And whatever the journey currently or the trajectory of journey, which are the challenges do you think that we are going to face in achieving those, those milestones? Thank you. I have to unmute myself. Thank you so much, Malik. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, here among uh, experts. So your first question, if I understood correctly, was what are the major reforms in healthcare financing in India towards achieving UHC? Now, uh, you know, 
I uh, have been telling Malik that I would take a slightly different view about reform. So let me just say that more countries around the world we have seen are rolling out EHC programs uh, to design uh, it in such a way that to expand access to healthcare and reduce the number of people impoverished by paying uh, for healthcare they need. And if you talk about healthcare financing to move to a such a system, you needed you need financing uh, reforms in broadly three areas: revenue raising, pooling of funds, and purchasing health services. These are vital for UHC. But you also need something that goes with your UHC reforms or with your health financing reforms. That is the health system strengthening, but where you ensure availability and quality uh, care and providers and health facilities. So all of that I consider could be part of a whole sector financing reform towards UHC. Now, can we say that India is on the path of health sector financing reforms? Now, if I'm uh, very critical, I would say no, but if I'm <laughs> more charitable, I would say like the World Bank has, that India is basically undertaking progressive universalism. So you're expanding coverage slowly and trying to ensure that the poor and the vulnerable are not left behind. So to that extent, some of the initiatives that India has taken recently can be uh, called reforms, uh, but I'll qualify that later. Now, the major... Uh, recent uh, initiative has been the Ayushman Bharat, as many of you know, which is a major health sector program started in uh, 2018, under which we had two arms. We had the health and wellness centers where you were essentially revamping primary care, and the other was a mostly an insurance-based system to give uh, coverage to poor people uh, for tertiary care, secondary and tertiary care. Now, I'll talk about the real reform here, I'll talk about the health and wellness centers first, or the potential real reform. Now, there is a global consensus that UHC can only be achieved if you have a strong foundation of primary healthcare system, and India has been floundering in our primary healthcare system for a very long time. So the HWC initiative, which aims to address uh, the challenges in our primary health care system, uh, and it focuses on strengthening the various tiers of the system is I think is a very good initiative. Um, it is supposed to widen the package of services, stress on continuum of care, provide additional healthcare provider at peripheral level and all of that. And so far India has about 70,000 such HWCs uh, where you've transformed the sub centers, the primary health centers, the urban primary health centers, et cetera, to make what you now are, call, are calling comprehensive health uh, healthcare centers or the health and wellness centers. So I think this in a way under the, AB, uh, the Ayushman Bharat program or initiative, this is a real step towards reforms because we really needed revamping of primary health care uh, in the country. However, uh, at the same time, I would say that somehow, uh, I feel that the other arm, the insurance arm is being given much more prominence than the HWC. The HWC needs much more attention. It needs much more funds, uh, the ability to work with states. So the states can adapt to local needs. Uh, this is a good chance to focus on referrals and linkages like Vietnam has apparently done that strengthen the referral system. We can do it through the Health and Wellness Center initiative and you need to really give it good funding uh, for sustainability. Coming to the other uh, initiatives, so uh, just to finish on the HWC, I think there's a huge potential in the HWC initiative and it's a very good step towards health sector reform and in financing. The other arm, which is a publicly financed health insurance scheme, uh, the PMJ, uh, the John R. Eggy Yojana or uh, National Health Insurance Scheme, is a large tax funded uh, scheme uh, and it's been called world's largest health assurance scheme uh, which provides a cover of about uh, five lakhs for a family per year and it's supposed to provide financial support for secondary and tertiary care hospitalization to the peer, about 500 million of india's poorest uh, population uh, through various models insurance model is one but there's a trust model and there's a mixed model 
Now, the good news is that uh, it has been done through a huge IT investment. So it has uh, superior IT and governance systems. It does, you know, the capacity has been built up. And I think Nishanjan is going to talk about some of that. At least he knows a lot about it. Uh, you're building state capacity, this training, management, all of that is all very good. Portable benefits, I think all that is, is, is very nice and that's a good thing. Um, there are issues about payment system, et cetera, but my question is that uh, to make it really a uh, reform, uh, health financing reform, we have to uh, think of three things. Uh, has PMJ really been able to pool resources? Because it's one of the largest programs, then it has to focus on pooling. Now, uh, the immediate answer is no. It, it's, it's really one system that has been put down on, on a very fragmented system. There are some good moves. For instance, our only social health insurance system, that scheme, uh, the state insurance uh, corporation runs the employee state insurance scheme. There is uh, some, uh, uh, you know, there's news that they are going to merge that with PMJ, which is, I think, an excellent step towards pooling. And if that happens, that's very good. And uh, it can be broadened and more such fragmented schemes can be brought under the same umbrella. So it has a huge potential for pooling. Now, uh, the strategic purchasing under PMJ, there has been a lot of work done. So I would give credit where credit is due. Uh, there have been a lot of calculations, consultation, et cetera, but uh, there are studies that have shown that the rates are really not been costed. The benefit packages have been not costed properly. They're often below the actual cost. So there are companies, insurance companies that are not very interested. And also, uh, while the, the impaneled hospitals cover both, are both private and public, we have seen that a lot of public sector hospitals are more involved than private because of these rate issues. But finally, PMG, if it has to run well, even for a moment, if you assume that this is a real health sector reform towards UHC, uh, where are the resources to back up the PMJ initiative. And our finance commission work has shown that if you want PMJ to be truly successful and cover everyone that it intends to cover, the cost would be much higher and a much higher allocation will be required per year. Uh, in any case, how well the scheme is doing can only be evidenced by a technically sound evaluation study on out-of-pocket expenditure, there aren't that many studies. One from Chhattisgarh seems to suggest that it hasn't really happened. And PMJ has not been able to reduce out-of-pocket expenditures. But I would say that there are not enough studies, so we can't generalize. Uh, my final point on this, this particular issue is that unless PMJ is expanded in scope and coverage fairly quickly, the, the uh, the reform nature of it is going to dissipate very, very fast because it will introduce further distortions in the healthcare market because it covers only IPD, it covers only one section, it doesn't really pool across income and across risk. So in that sense, it's not a classic UHC uh, initiative. But in the meantime, if you're gradually going to move towards, uh, towards universal health coverage using PMJ as a vehicle, you have to do that fairly fast. You can't wait. Um, the last point on this thing uh, uh, Malik Hamid mentioned is that we often do not talk enough about the national health mission or the national rural health mission as it started. Now, there are lots of problems with NRHM and the NHM, uh, you know, utilization, underutilization, very rigid structure of, of devolution, et cetera. But the NHM was actually a true reform in the sense that it, it, it uh, changed a lot of the parameters in rural health system and uh, gave the states a lot of flexibility, et cetera. And if we could have worked on the gaps of the NHM, uh, I think it would have remained a very good vehicle uh, for uh, health system strengthening. What has actually happened is that NHM funding has also been going down steadily, which is, I think, rather sad. So uh, I would just stop here saying that uh, on your first question, so there are some critical initiatives as a, as a uh, taking in totality all these initiatives, do we have a health sector financing reform in the country? I must say that we are not quite there. We're moving towards it if we quickly do some course correction and remedy the current gaps. So that's your uh, first question, uh, Malik. Do you want me to... 
Yeah. Go on. Uh, we'll come to you later. I think so. We'll come to you later. Uh, I think so. Let's let's go to Nishan because I think you have raised very okay. pertinent points on PMG. So yeah. Nishan, uh, uh, we know that you know uh, PMG uh, has done a lot of good things and it has been appreciated a lot and it has also been kind of evaluated a lot uh, critically in, in terms of the way it is it is uh, helping in kind of uh, giving financial risk protection. So based on your experiences with RSPI and PMG, you know, what would you say that which are the areas that 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 PMG needs to uh, work on uh, to enhance uh, its ability for uh, social health protection in our country? Thanks, Malik, and I hope I'm audible. So, yeah, thank you. yeah and so thanks for the invitation and uh, very interesting question. And uh, Indrani, you talked quite correctly about the challenges which are being faced in PMJ and also whether it's a it's a prog so it's a step towards UHC or whether it's a standalone thing which you know which is okay on its own but does not contribute much towards UHC. And I think this is something which. As a country, we need to also take a call, you know, the policymakers who are there. Because in India, often we say that things happen in piecemeal way and without a strategy, many times things happen where there's no consolidated or comprehensive strategy. But many things happen which on their own uh, are nice, but they don't fit with each other. For example, even under Aishwan Bharat, Health and Wellness Center and PMJ both started, uh, but both started in parallel. You know, and uh, there was no linkage between both of them, but ideally they should have been. But the good thing is that now government has started towards bringing them together. So now government will be coming out soon with a kind of a continuum of care approach where a, a person who comes to a health and wellness center for, let's suppose, for checkup, and then if there is a referral, then that person enters into PMJ if that person is eligible, that kind of thing will happen. And that will certainly help in improving the, the, the care and also in bringing the continuum of care approach, at least for that category of population which are covered. So one good thing which has happened in the PMJ is that it has been able to consolidate a lot of state level schemes and the national scheme. So before launch of PMJ, there were 24 or 26 states which were running their own scheme. And some of them were in, con in, in combination with RSPY, some of them were standalone. But now after PMJ, most of those schemes have now converged with PMJ. So at least they follow the, in most of the states, except few, they follow the same benefit cover, they follow the same IT platform, they follow uh, same kind of packages, at least if not the exact rate, at least the, the principles are same. So a lot of uh, convergence have been brought in with respect to PMJ and the state scheme, which is fine. But I think the challenge which PMJ faces right now, I think are, are, are few. First is in terms of being seen right now as a standalone scheme and not as a platform where others can also ride on. You know, I, I'm not talking about the government schemes, but like people who are not covered, like missing middle, which has been not covered. Uh, so how they how they will be brought into. So right now, those all are not part of the, at least the short-term plan. Uh, so that is left out. Second thing I think I feel is the biggest challenge for PMJ is the awareness. Because what we have seen, the states which are not running any health insurance schemes since past many years, though in those states, the awareness among people about PMJ and the, their rights and their benefit, uh, which they are allowed to, is very limited. And that is something which is which hampers the uptake of the scheme. And there, I think a lot of effort needs to go in improving the uptake. So from this, in improving the demand side, we need to work on creating the awareness amongst the beneficiaries. That is, I think, is the primary thing where, uh, and also empowering them in, in, in a way that they can reach the hospital where they need to get the treatment. And to improve the supply side, I think we need to do one that we need to also improve on the packages which are being paid, the package rates and all, because that is something where a lot of uh, input comes from the field. And I think uh, NHA is National Health Authority is working towards creating some kind of system which works on improving the packages as we go along. Or maybe India can even consider thinking about things like DRGs and all, which could be even if not in next one year, but in next few years, you migrate to them because you need a lot of data, a lot of systems to be set up for that. That is also not cheap. But I think improving the, uh, the rates is important, but at the same time also ensuring that the money goes in time to the hospital. Because even if the hospital agrees to work on a lesser rate, but if they get money after one month or two months or three months, then they lose the motivation. And that's where I think so improving the cost of the packages at the same time ensuring that the claims are paid in time 
both things uh, from the hospital perspective and third is the training and the capacity building of the people who are involved there i think these few things if uh, the government can work on and nha can work on further i think that will certainly help in improving the performance of the scheme and i completely agree that there have been few evaluations but not good enough to say how it will work and how it has in terms of out of pocket what has the what has been the impact but i think that uh, some some more evaluations are being started which will help in getting us some more uh, policy level inputs and some evidence from the field so thank you molika stop uh, thank you richard i think so you made a very valid point in kind of the pmj looked at standalone versus how it is to be integrated and whether it's it as a policy to look at achieving universal health coverage or just uh, risk protection uh, one of one of the interesting thing that indian health system faces is availability of funds so i i'll now migrate to another topic uh, to gautam gautam one of one of the thing that we always talk about is uh, availability of resources uh, to fund uh, our our public uh, finance schemes so in in your and you you are leading this innovative financing uh, portfolio at usid what are what are various innovative models which can further enhance availability of resources uh, uh, for healthcare in our country okay i think uh, that's a good topic because uh, there is something important that you said that when we talk of uh, more resources for the healthcare how we can look at the public health now my question is uh, when we talk of health and when we know that say uh, 60% of uh, uh, hospital care is in the private sector 80% of outpatient care is in the private sector now there had been this tendency that uh, we distinguish between public and private as if those are two separate worlds and let's deal with public and private uh, let the market take care of itself but on the other hand i think uh, one major issue that always faces everybody both within public public finance and also larger uh, market where investors are taking a decision where to invest or not so the issue is uh, how much do we need to invest in healthcare and cutting across all levels whether it is secondary care uh, tertiary care or even uh, basic primary healthcare that we talk of and whatever we need to invest are we getting enough investments both within public and private sector and what are the drivers for this so i think when we talk of uh, innovations i think uh, like dr indrani really raised a very important point that uh, nhm per se was a big reform where uh, you not only decentralized the uh, financing decision through having all these uh, layers of societies whether it's a district society uh, rks and all different levels also shifting from a typical uh, the government designated officer who can authorize finances to a committee at, with communities and others involved the way uh, nhm expenditure is uh, happening so nhm per se was a big reform uh, of course we have to look at where it succeeded what are the causes and uh, other reasons also looking at uh, the uh, pooling and that uh, nishant was talking about i think i'll really leave it to nishant for uh, getting into the details of pooling and what are the reforms whether we can look at as a platform how we are evolving can at, at some point of time evolve into covering only hospital care to have some add on basic primary care or uh, basic diagnostics and uh, outpatient as to so those are some of the reforms that we talk of but uh, as you uh, molik asked about how we can generate more money i think uh, uh, the three typical functions of finance getting more finances pooling and paying uh, let me focus on the first and the last getting more finances and uh, using the power of money to really drive the outcomes that we want in terms of innovative uh, pay for results mechanism so let me begin with the pay for result mechanism i think uh, typically what the government has been trying to do especially for primary healthcare sector is trying to provide with equity with coverage with quality a lot of primary healthcare nhm had been uh, 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 initiative in that process the uh, health and wellness center is another initiative to complement nhm all but when we really want to drive something as a provisioning i think even if you want to provide just one care say immunization there are hundreds of things that you need to do supplies deliveries cold chain human resources a whole lot of thing that needs to be done now the question is from the government point of view what is more efficient of course delivering a whole lot of things say 100 things needs to be done you are not able to do one but accomplish 99 it's not a 99% success because that one thing might means entire thing stops so can we look at some innovative ways of driving 
the outcome that we want at the price that we are comfortable with and let the market forces organize itself to drive it at the price that we choose at the quality that we choose so those were some of the experiments in uh, pay for results mechanism impact bonds that uh, within usaid we tried for example in the state of rajasthan uh, within 3 years uh, including 1 uh, and 1/2 years of covid we could actually get more than 400 hospitals accredited both for mabh as well as the clinical standard of manita given by foxy so 405 hospitals accredited all these are this smaller hospital 15 20 30 bedded hospital located in outskirts of big cities or in small towns so either in the small towns you have a non functional csc csc or in big cities medical college covers the heart but the uh, periphery is left out so these are the areas that these hospitals serve but were not having a quality certification a normal quality certification exercise can 15 hospital takes around 2 to 3 years but through a dip model where the focus was payment trigger is when this hospitals get the certificate so there is no approved methodology there is no approved uh, activity that you have to do do whatever it takes to get this hospital quality certified so you get money once you deliver so taking a similar example we went to uh, uh, madhya pradesh for tb nutrition so what was happening was all patients who were completing tb treatment only around 5 to 8% were gaining weight as per the clinically uh, approved standards what that meant was 60% of them in spite of completing tb treatment were likely to catch tb again which will be mdr and 40% were supposed to die uh, statistically uh, are likely to die in spite of completing the treatment so gaining weight so now if we put our money that okay we pay only when those patients who are anyway undergoing treatment from the government also gains weight do whatever it takes so there is no ap- uh, appropriate methodology do whatever it takes the result is they have to gain weight so through that what was around 5 to 7% within one and half years it increased to 75 to 80% so these are the small examples again uh, it's not a uh, there is no act we don't have that kind of a thing but we have a counterfactual of 5% against which we got say 75 to 80% working with the Uh, around 1000 tb patients in dhar district so what i'm trying to say is one let's try to use the power of money whether it is the funding agencies like usaid whether it is the government let's also try means apart from provisioning which has to be done let's also try to innovate around using this power of money to drive the quality and the range of outcomes that we want at the price that we fix and let people come invest do whatever innovation is needed and deliver that so that is uh, on the uh, outcome based uh, funding uh, some innovations i talked about uh, impact bonds and uh, pay for result mechanism on getting more funds i think uh, i'm also running short of time so quickly on getting more funds uh, there are various uh, public finance reforms or public finance innovations that can be done but let me talk about complementary role that private investments can play what covid has really shown is the huge gap in infrastructure people in april may running around not having bed not having oxygen really threw this up that apart from primary care for uh, uh, this resurgence whether were third wave fourth wave whatever we have we need a huge investment on in infrastructure also do we have the money with the gdp already shrinking and our tax gdp ratio falling to 11% where is the money can the government put in the money so there is some money lying somewhere can we get that now question is yes there is money there is money uh, with uh, investors there is money with uh, people in general we can pool even uh, 50 rupees uh, contributed by uh, crores of people would mean a lot but do we really have those financial instruments or are our financial markets capable enough to democratize philanthropy in a way that philanthropy is not only driven by some rich individuals but can we really collate through say some kind of uh, say social bonds or maybe uh, healthcare mutual funds where even individuals monthly can contribute say 100 rupees but just like uh, they contribute to a, a sip the uh, the savings uh, scheme that we have can we contribute as philanthropy also so i think there are different ways we can do it but one of the important things that we had tried was uh, blended finance approach and that is also uh, i would just like to mention here quickly that sometimes we look at the development world and the commercial world as two separate universes so commercial world would be a separate universe and grant funded mechanism will go along as a separate universe but uh, through our various experiments what we have learned is if there is value real value for the people it is something that somewhere somebody is saving money and that does not necessarily mean that the people who get the service have to pay but somebody will save money if say inflation rates come down or people are more healthy or if hospitalization rates come down insurance companies save money so can we channelize that money to fund some kind of preventive or maybe 
uh, ecosystem level investments to drive these which means we combine grants with debt and equity maybe venture debt and venture equity to really take care of all the ecosystem needs of the healthcare investments that are needed so these are just quick uh, small examples maybe uh, later if we have time we can go into the details thank you thank you very much gautam and i think so this whole uh, the, the point the argument that you made is moving towards outcome based payment i think so if the systems are evolved enough i think so even public sector we need to move towards outcome based to enhance the efficiency of the current allocation of resources uh i i i'll move now to uh, uh, webo i think so uh, one of one of the uh, points that even indrani mam alluded is is and and uh, uh nishant has shared about this in, in past that esi scheme has got a huge potential in in the way it can strengthen our currently healthcare delivery system and giving social protection so maybe from your experience you know how esi can further strengthen in addressing the gaps both in terms of coverage and in terms of Uh, uh, overall financial risk protection. What are your learnings from the work, the social protection work that you've been doing uh, at ILO? Uh, thank you, Mal Malik, and thank you for having me on the panel. Uh, it's very helpful to have the speakers before me set the ground, set the agenda here, and also the context in which ESIC is operating in India. Uh, to begin with, I would also uh, echo what uh, Claude earlier and Maria later said about how ILO approaches uh, social health protection as a part of the larger agenda on social protection. so our agenda is quite set in that sense uh, with the social uh, sustainable development goals and our own instruments uh, as far as our current work with the sic goes i mean the significance of esic is clear to everyone it covers nearly a tenth of india's population through a contributory scheme provides benefits which go beyond medical uh, coverage but uh, you know the expenses pattern show that that is the most prominent part of their expenditure uh at the same time esic operates uh, i mean since 2015 a lot has been changing in esic although again piecemeal i would say not in a very coherent fashion and the coverage has actually doubled between 2012 and 2020 the number of beneficiaries have doubled in this period and so has the income and therefore the premise of our entering uh, you know uh, to support esic is twofold one uh that it is widely known that the scheme services are highly underutilized across the country and you could you'll see the pattern varying across states so some states are doing rather well whereas many of the states are not doing so well and this is a function of the fact that a large part of service delivery under esi scheme happens through the state governments uh and each of the state government has a very diverse way of uh, managing esic somewhere the ministry of finance is involved somewhere the ministry of health is involved other places uh, the labor ministry is looking after it so things like that so it's a rather complex system it's 70 years old and it works with the ministry of labor and employment uh, so it's not a you know typical social uh, health insurance program it's a wider social protection program which works with the ministry of labor and till recently till the last decade maybe there was not so much attention on esic as a as an actor in the uhc agenda but over the last few years all of us are aware there are intense debates about what should esic do how it can be more effective and so on and esic itself has been opening up to these questions so some of the things that we have noticed first of all coverage i've already mentioned but at the same time uh, the way they used to cover areas geographical coverage has also expanded rather dramatically uh, so now they are covering fully uh, 50, 566 districts in the country uh, out of the 718 and uh, what has happened is that the service delivery has not been able to keep pace with with the with the expansion of the beneficiary base and this results in a number of problems that we see in the data on esic the most prominent being a large unspent reserve uh, that esic has now there was a question whether uh, is this too much or too little uh from our assessment if esic were actually to make its coverage effective that is provide the services that it promises in its package uh this would just be sufficient or maybe a little less than sufficient uh and the expansion is still ongoing so the beneficiary base is also expanding so in that case this is not a surplus fund as such but this is a reserve fund now the question or the challenge is how to most effectively utilize it and how to have some immediate gains because uh healthcare needs of of its beneficiary population of or of anyone cannot be postponed till an institution reforms itself so uh the the quite a few things happening uh recently and and both uh, professor gupta and uh, nishant have mentioned that uh, the pmj is collaborating with esic 
Now, at present, it's a pilot going on in 152 districts, and, and the collaboration right now is at a rather limited level, which is basically sharing of health service providers mutually. So PMJ beneficiaries can access ESI facilities and vice versa. Uh, however, uh, we have been informed by ESIC that larger discussions are ongoing as to how this convergence can be deeper and more meaningful. And not just with PMJ, but ESIC is also opening up to join the larger health sector reforms movement that's happening. Uh, and by movement, I mean the various things that are happening. You know, there is the National Digital Health Mission under which they are trying to upgrade their IT systems uh, in order to scale up their activities because uh, their geographical coverage is too much to, you know, very quickly cater to. Uh, then they are also part of the, and, and for the government and for everyone, ESIC is a major actor. It's among probably the third or the fourth, fourth largest spender uh, or purchaser of services in the health sector in India. So in that sense, it does have a role that it cannot, you know, avoid noticing in the larger UHC agenda. Uh, now, what are the challenges that we have come across? Health financing is one, and it's it's quite complex. There are payment system issues. A major issue that they face is coordination with the state governments, because for say every insured person and their family, uh, they would for every insured person actually they would give three thousand rupees to the state government based on on the budget request. And then the state government has to spend that money. Now, this particular transaction is probably has 29 or 32 form, uh, forms, depending on the number of states and union territory, territories it covers. And, and each of the state has its own, like I said, system of handling it. And this leads to a very high degree of variation in its performance across states. Uh, one of the things that ESIC has done recently is introduced this concept of state autonomous bodies called ESI societies which I think four or five states have adopted. And the hope there is to streamline at least the financing part between the state and the center uh, in some of these states, and hopefully other states will also gradually adapt. Uh, the other thing is there have been quite a few debates about whether ESIC is actually capable of uh, you know, fulfilling its agenda. Uh, now, that, that has to some extent, the government has shown great faith in ESIC, the recently legislated uh, Social Security Code of 2020, uh, not only uh, retains the ESIC's role in the larger social protection uh, framework, but also expands it, ma its mandate. Now, ESIC would be progressively covering uh, gig and platform workers and also plantation workers. There have been recent news items how municipal corporation workers will also be covered. Uh, one thing to be clear when, when this discussion on extension of coverage and ESIC's role in uh, social health protection of workers comes, it is to be clear that ESIC works under a very clearly defined legal framework, which sets who it can cover and who it cannot cover. And one of the uh, driving factors here of inclusion or exclusion is to have a clear employer-employee relationship. Where I think ESIC departs a bit from uh, general or typical health insurance programs. So in, in that sense, uh, one has to look at ESIC in that sense that it would be covering the formal sector and all types of workers within. Uh, there are quite a few uh, measures uh, of reforms afoot, and uh, what ILO is doing is supporting ESIC as much as possible through evidence generation. We have conducted two very large-scale surveys on beneficiary expectations and behavior. So I can speak more on these, uh, on what we have been doing and what we think a theory of change could be, maybe in, in, in the discussion part. Thank you, Molly. Thank you very much, Mirabha. And it's, 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 it's heartening to see the way, I think, so the social protection code can be kind of enhancing the role of ESIS. But one thing what I've understood from this uh, uh, four colleagues, that said, I think so we need another discussion on these in a much more detail than what we are having right now. Uh, but we are running short of time, uh, so I think so we'll cut down. But for me, it's a, it's a pleasure to ask this question to uh, uh, Lalit now. Lalit, you know, we have been talking a lot, uh, and ESIS, it is still a public sector uh, undertaken, uh, NHM or X, uh, PMG, what Indranim M talked about, uh, health and wellness. So we are talking a lot about public sector or publicly financed healthcare in our country. But Gautam also alluded that around 65 plus minus percentage of our healthcare is excess from private sector. And no matter, even though there are equity and, and quality concerns, which are always raised on the private sector, in India, it is one force to reckon it as far as delivered healthcare is concerned. And when I say private sector, it's also it's a private insurance space. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in that context, Lalit, what would be your views on the way the private health insurance sector can 
address health systems question in terms of coverage quality uh, right. efficiency how do you think the private sector can 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 really or private health insurance particularly can help us in in moving towards universal health coverage sure sure uh, thank you molik and uh, uh, very interesting question so i think we all know uh, still is a new concept Lot talked about uh, being in the teen aging of uh, the organization. I think health insurance industry in India got privatized in about 2000. So just, just kind of crossed those teen years and entering those troubled 20s, really. I think the result of these 20 years is that you know, it has become more popular, more common in that we now have more than 30 companies offering health insurance service and six of them are only offering it. So we have specialist health insurance companies in India as well. And I think the net result of this 10 years of this service provision is that we have about 10% of people you know, covered uh, under private health insurance. So while it looks like, is that a good number? Is that reasonable after 20 years is, a, is an open-ended question really. But I think few things that I wanted to highlight within this 10% as well. So while we have these 10% population covered in the private medical insurance, there are two broad concerns or anxieties around it. One is you know, like there is still significant underinsurance within this 10%. So the product cover offered today is a very uh, standard in indemnity hospitalization product. It doesn't cover the outpatient coverage, the primary care, or even the community services like physio, dental, other things as well. And that's what you know what Gotham was referring to is the out-of-pocket contribution. So there are still uh, you know gaps in the uh, coverage provisions for these 10% that is there. Even the people are covered, you know, a lot of those policies are not really very high tickets. You know, the sum insured demand for them may not really cover a, you know, a tertiary hospital bill. So there is also coverage as to is that adequate coverage. You know, a typical policy might allow you 2% of sum insured for an ICU day stay. A one lakh policy would not cover the rent of an ICU, a daily rent for ICU in that limit. So then there are coverages and that kind of puts pressure on the out-of-pocket component as well. Having said that, you know, there is uh, the other component as well, which we don't talk about, which is the uninsured element. We heard about, you know, this is only covering the affluent and there is a missing middle. I think within this, we typically get 10 to 15% of policy applicants do not get covered, either because of age or existing health condition. You could argue those chronic condition, people actually need their protection even more. Uh, they're not enough coverage of those. So we're missing those 10, 15% people who do reach to our customer, uh, customers who reach to the insurance door and want insurance coverage. They miss out on this. Also, because the entry product for uh, entry for a product, uh, age for a product entry is roughly 65 years, right? That's kind of ruling out those seven, eight percent of our elderly population who may want to have the resources to pay for their own insurance. There's not enough you know, services or products available for them. Uh, then the younger ones, you know, the first jobbers, you know, just kind of setting in, they don't see a need for insurance. There's also that perception uh, from a younger population whether they need insurance at all. So these are some segments, you know, we're missing out on this insurance journey and the under insurance, the other component. I think Nishant covered it briefly as a missing middle. So it's the unorganized sector, you know, that cab driver or the local shop owner or the worker at a shop owner who are not poor enough or not in an organized sector to get a public sector uh, scheme or a ASIC coverage, but not rich enough to buy a pol policy coverage as well. I think those are the two broad areas which are still missing the component. There's still disparity. We see penetration higher in states where there's urbanization of good private sub supply, private hospital supply, but there's, you know, states which do not have enough urbanization, do not have enough private hospital structure you know they're missing out a bit and those have been the the gap areas where the industry is beginning to focus as they have stabilized and set up their operations so we now see an emergence of you know focus on those two or three or four cities you know as the supply side gets better you know they get the distribution better and as more and more channels are happening and the banker channel and more kind of aggregator services happening we see a small drift in that direction Certainly, the last year uh, in a pandemic uh, certainly uh, raised awareness levels a lot more. People, rather than a push product, I think there's a certainly demand for it. Do I have enough coverage today? Do I, uh, you know, do I need what kind of product do I need? So we're getting a lot more uh, uh, surge in demand. So there's certainly the heightened awareness about the need for insurance. So that certainly has made it a bit of a facilitation in terms of the surge in demand. Uh, insurance companies kind of organizing their operation better to handle the you know, virtual space better, and you know, being able to continue with that. There were two cycles of uh, renewals remember the last april and this sec after the second wave as well so they have also managed their efficiencies better and now better poised to you know look at the next uh, segment to cover these gap areas i think that's the, that's the way the industry is shaping at the moment uh, the regulator has been very supportive as well in that 
there is uh, opportunity for insurers to experiment projects. So they can try something as a pilot project and you know, that allows them to experiment, test things out, see the experience, and then have the option to walk away or to refine it further. And so those kind of allow opportunity for some innovation. And we're beginning to see some impact of that. There are you know, about 15 projects by different insurance companies under that uh, in sandbox, uh, pilot sandbox scheme. And we're beginning to see a lot more uh, new products coming. You know, we have some elderly products being launched. You know, we have some disease specific coverages being launched. So insurance services at least focusing on these underinsured uh, top up grants and things like that. Uh, the worry is the, the rural and the unorganized sector or the uh, lower income, uh, lower middle group, and that hasn't quite got the attention of the insurance yet because they do have some immediate you know, focus areas where they see better conversion. Uh, I think just thought that's kind of broadly summarizes the current status in the direction. Thank you, Lalit. And I think so. What you have said is also resonant to the points that Indrani Ma'am made earlier. I think so. The health system overall, and looking at financial yeah. space in the in the overall uh, uh, a continuum of care or kind of larger ecosystem is very important. But it's yeah. it's good to see that you know uh, I think so. Uh, there are in, in health finance and equity space there is an argument for and against insurance, uh, uh, private insurance, or out of pocket uh, uh, voluntary insurance. But I think so. In our context, uh, as far as uh, I think so. We we have got this innovations going on, and I think so. It's it's it's, it's something that, at, in a larger ecosystem, we need to be mindful about. So sure. I think so. Uh, thank you very much, Lalit. I think so. From we have we have heard kind of from various kind of uh, healthcare financing uh, experts uh, focusing on reforms on a public private partnership in context of PMJ Health and the center ESIS. One of one of the countries that has had us had us done uh, good in terms of uh, uh, kind of achieving universal health coverage uh, uh, through financing reforms is Thailand. So let's hear from Angus Mali on Paul Park on what 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 did Thailand do differently uh, or was something very specific that we can learn from Thailand. And before uh, I hand over the floor, uh, I think so. We are already five minutes over. Please bear with us for uh, 10, 15 minutes more, and we try to wrap up as soon as possible. Uh, uh, to you. The floor is to you. Thank you. Okay, because Thailand uh, achieved the universal health coverage after uh, implementing the universal health coverage scheme in 2002. And this scheme has covered the informal sector workers and cover 75% uh, 70, of total population and financed by the tax revenues. Therefore, uh, the lesson that I would like to share with you today is about cost containment that is it the main feature of the universal health coverage scheme. Uh, first, to contain the cost for healthcare, it is better to have the gatekeeping system and focusing on the primary healthcare at the first level of service. And this could prevent people to have unnecessary utilization of high level of care. So second, uh, the payment mechanism also work because for the UCS scheme uh, to fix and control the cost of care, it apply the cost and payment and it includes the capitation and uh, a case-based payment with the global budget ceiling. And third, uh, strategic purchasing can work well as, as well. Because when you apply the strategic purchasing, uh, the allocation of the healthcare budget will be allocated based on the cash payment population. And this can make the system could address the needs and distribution of the healthcare throughout the country. And the last one is about the uh, medicine right medicine can be expensive but in the UCS scheme uh, um, all medicine will be prescribed based on the essential drug list and encourage the uh, generic drug prescription yeah and this is all the lesson that I would like to share today yeah thank you in, in this entire process how did people edge help you know, that's that's another question that I have for you before I can I can Okay. Have it uh, to go. <laughs> People H is uh, uh, a network that have 
a main goal to facilitate the partnership contribution and engagement. And this includes the knowledge sharing and technical exchange based on needs of the members and involve the all partners on the healthcare financing and social health protection for USC. So I believe that P4H member can be benefits from the P4H products and activities. For example, uh, as mentioned earlier, and we have the P4H digital platform that have updated the news information of each country and you can look for the country page. And actually this webinar also like a populate in the country page as well. And another example is a cross country study. And currently we have the uh, strengthening health financing system during COVID and participating countries are China, Mongolia, Korea, and Singapore. And currently we also conduct the, the short survey as well, like an informal one to explore the needs of the user. If you got the, the survey that I sent, you might respond and what and then we, we can know like a, what you would like to participate or involve in our activities. And the last one, we have the Korean, Korean uh, conversation and connection between uh, policy makers and academic institutions in Asia countries like Thailand, Korea, China, and Australia. And this could lead to another joint products or activities in the future. And this is just uh, like a, a little, the tip of the iceberg. And you can explore more in the website of the P4H or you can reach me through the email if you have further questions, yeah. I will leave my email in the message. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angus Muller. So I think so uh, for me, uh, we have run short of time. Uh, uh, we have already crossed 10 minutes, but uh, as, as a moderate, I would acknowledge that there are, there are, there are fantastic kind of comments going in the chat box uh, from uh, Gidjam M as well. Uh, and before I close up, if there, is, there, is, there, is, there was a question that I, I wanted to ask uh, uh, Indrani ma'am before closing up there. Ma'am, you heard about uh, various colleagues uh, uh, various colleagues about the way uh, things are evolving at a systemic level. Uh, would you like to comment on that before we close? Mm -hmm. In the context, yeah, Malik, uh, I, I don't think I can say do justice to what I want to say in one minute. But uh -huh. basically, the biggest challenge right now in India to uh, in uh, health sector reforms and UHC is acknowledging that we have problems. And I think when you acknowledge that we have a lot of problems in financing and health system strengthening in personnel, medical education, the list is very long, Malik. So you need reforms in every one of those areas, in personnel, in infrastructure, in medical supplies. We saw what happened during COVID and we had to fix the health system in real time. You don't do that. So I think the point is that universal health coverage is not a magic bullet that can be just plonked down on the country without reforming the other parts of the system as a whole. So I think what is currently required, I think two things. One is to go back to the drawing board and figure out what parts of the health system we need to fix before or while we are doing UHC. So I'm not saying stop everything and then reform. Do whatever you have to do, but you also start reforming. The other is health financing. I mean, we are not serious. If we have, were serious in the last budget, we would have seen an increase, but that 137, we have de deconstructed that. That's not true. And it has actually gone down. If you see the, the core health system uh, investments are going down, that is not going to let us move towards UHC. And third is, uh, I quickly want to sum this up because there are many things I want to say, is that regulation we have not taken seriously at all. I mean, some people touched on it. Even the Clinical Establishment Act has not been adopted by more than 11 states. Even there, there are so many issues. The standard uh, treatment guidelines have not been adopted. So if you were really serious about PMJ or universal health coverage, we would also put regulation in place. So for me, the challenges are, uh, whether we really want to do this, if we did, we would find the finances. Innovative financing is good, but cannot support UHC, cannot support HSS. 
we need poor finances and we have enough instances of finances being used elsewhere where they did not have to be used so my own thing is that be serious get serious get a technical expert group together and let them sit down and figure out what the real reforms would be in the various areas that need reforming thank you thank you gentlemen i think so you you have done a, a job for me also instead of paraphrasing everything that uh, as far as the panel is concerned i think so we have fantastic view and we have seen a certain kind of directional a positive directions in terms of of enhancing uh, uh, the provision of care and and financing availability at least innovative models which can finance healthcare but even what lalit said and even what you also may have referred and even what uh, 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 nishant has referred to i think so we need both health system strengthening uh, as as a core component and financing becoming a part of that uh but and and for that we need multi pronged approaches rather than one uh, magic bullet that's going to cure everything and so that's what my take up is uh so without kind of uh, uh delaying uh, uh, further i would i would hand it over to anur once again and, and thank you very much uh, everyone uh, in the rani ma'am nishan gautam lalit webber uh, for for being part of the panel and this is just a beginning from what we have heard today we have identified certain areas through which we are going to kind of explore our next webinars uh, so that we can have detailed conversation on those things as we move forward thank you um thank you everyone i will just join molik in uh thanking all of today's panelists speakers uh the guests who have listened to attentively and who have asked very good questions in the chat box and in the q and a section i'm really thrilled and have benefited a lot from this rich conversation which was possible thanks to the professionalism and rich vast professional experience of our speakers uh, it was enlightening i would like to add that india is a very dynamic um, country with hu rich human resources potential vast um, opportunities for prosperity and i think uh, this is really going to be a very uh, beneficial series of webinars and the first one has been launched today and i can congratulate everyone with this um i would like to uh, again thank the organizers of the event which was the p4h coordination desk uh including the team led by bayar christine pratyasha but um, uh, most of all the panelists who have spoken today and who represent a very vast uh, diversity of uh, global actors and partners representing ilo jiz usaid uh, milliman uh, ieg and uh, other agencies and organizations uh and i cannot thank enough um with a special um you know emotions today's moderator of the panel session for india uh, molik chokshi he did such an excellent job and we really enjoyed watching this um section the uh, india panel was really rich and important and interesting uh and to everyone um uh, tushar mokashi gunesh gunit i'm sorry uh who represent our indian partners uh, the core organizers which is access health international and ihsc excellent job by organizing team here uh again thank you all to dear speakers uh and to guests i hope we can always go back to the recording and watch it again um i agree with panelists that diagnosing the gaps is already some success but not enough so we will work together in our journey to exploring the methods models strategies solutions that would be best applied in our respective countries and areas of work 